and hopefully some more people will join us. But uh, this is a beautiful beginning. Hi, everybody. So we're in for a real treat tonight. We not only have Tony Ballard's wonderful playing. <laughs> and uh, Tony, if you could have one song to get us started off, and then I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful guest from the Chicago area, Steve Sarowitz. I've been a Baha'i almost 50 years. Steve's been a Baha'i, what, about eight or 10 years? Uh, going on eight. Eight, eight. He knows a whole lot more than I do. I tell you, he's, he is uh, an amazing font of information. And what we want tonight is Steve's going to give some opening remarks, but we really want questions, okay? And questions will bounce off of each other, right? So this should be a very lively evening. We're counting on it. Thank you. Who is the best beloved is come? He who is the best beloved is come. He who is the best beloved. He who is the best beloved. He who is the best. Beloved is come. Now I want this a little louder. He who is the best beloved is come. He who is the best beloved is come. He who is the best beloved, he who is the best beloved, he who is the best beloved is come. There are me. Let us praise him. Let us praise him. Let us praise him, Baha'u'llah. Let us praise him. Let us praise him. Let us praise him, the glory of God. He who is the best beloved is come. He who is the best beloved is come. He who is the best beloved. He who is the best beloved. He who is. The best beloved is come. He who is the best beloved is come. He who is the best beloved is come. He who is the best. Beloved is come. He who is the best beloved is come. He who is the best 
Beloved is come. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve. Um, I will completely deny what Kathy said. I do not know more than her. I just know different things than her. And we all know different things. And that's really a part of the Baha'i faith, is to see the nobility in every human being. So we are one human family. If you want to know the heart of the Baha'i faith, it's that we're one human family. And what, you know, maybe to start out with is what is a Baha'i? What's the Baha'i faith? Raise your hand if you are a Baha'i. Raise your hand if you've heard of the Baha'i faith but are not a Baha'i. Okay. So we are all equals. So first of all, that's the first thing. So I don't, I, I don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable because of what they are or they aren't. Only God can judge us. And that's a big part of the Christian faith, the Baha'i faith, any faith is non-judgment. But I will tell you, I'll give you my ideas about the Baha'i faith, and they're my ideas. And I'm going to talk about something called progressive revelation. So for some of you, you it might be review. I'll try to make it interesting. But <clears throat> the essence of the Baha'i faith is that God is singular. There's not a Hindu God or a Buddhist God or a Christian God or a Muslim God. There's just a God who has forever loved his children and has forever taught us in every age, sent a prophet, a messenger in every age to educate us. And every messenger comes with the same two main things, the same spiritual teachings. What is the heart? Well, for example, how many people were raised as Christians? Raise your hand if you were raised as Christians. Quite a few. And what were the two most, command, two, two most important commandments that Jesus taught? Anybody? Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, and who else? And love God. And guess what Buddha taught? Love God and love your neighbor. And Muhammad, he taught love your neighbor too. It's called the golden rule. It's in every religion. The, the Muslim version is none of you truly believes unless he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. They're all teaching the golden rule. Love your neighbor. And yet, what do we do? We go out and hate in the name of God. We go and hate our Muslim neighbors or our Christian neighbors or our Jewish neighbors. When does Jesus ever say to do that or Muhammad? Never, never. What God is teaching us is this love your neighbor and compassion and justice and truth, love, kindness, all of this through every prophet. The second thing he's teaching, he's teaching the social laws and teachings of every age. And so imagine humanity as a singular human child going through school, through kindergarten and first grade and second grade and third grade. Of course, those lessons are going to change. He's giving us the lessons that we can understand in the time when we can understand them. To, to understand this concept a little bit better, I'm going to go back 4,000 years ago to the prophet Abraham. Now, God says to Abraham, go kill your only son. Now, from a, if you were Muslim, that would be Ishmael. To a Christian or a Jew, that would be Isaac, we're not going to argue about that. He says, go kill your son. So he ties up his son. And at the 11th hour, he gets the ram and he kills the ram. So anyone here, why? Why did God ask Muhammad to kill, or not Muhammad, to Abraham to kill his only son? Test his faith. So I have a son. His name is David. He's 20 now. He's too big for me to tie up. But let's say you and I are friends. I, I want to tie up little, not so little David here. And I'm going to kill him. And I say, hey, God's just testing my faith. Would you say that's great? Go ahead and kill him. Or would you call the police? Okay. You're going to stop me any way you can, right? So in the year 2023, we don't kill our children. But you wouldn't have done the same thing back in the time of Abraham. You know why? You wouldn't have called the police. There wasn't any police. There wasn't any phones. But there's also a really other big, big really big important thing to understand. And that is that child sacrifice was quite common. So in the time of Abraham, when this story is being told, child sacrifice is very common. And so doing away with that child sacrifice symbolically through this story makes a lot of sense. And what happens 500 years later, humanity progresses a little bit more. Moses codifies the new animal sacrifice. What happens 1500 years after that? Jesus comes along. He says, I'm the Paschal lamb. He sacrifices himself. And he says, no more animal sacrifice. Well, most of the Jews don't follow Jesus. The great majority don't. I'm descended from some of those Jews that didn't, actually, because I come from a Jewish background. But 
40 years after Jesus is crucified, 70 AD, the Jews rebel, and their temple is destroyed. And that's the temple where they actually did the sacrifices. So the Jews actually follow Jesus, even though they don't think they're following Jesus. And I actually, two years ago, asked my parents, why don't Jews sacrifice animals? And they said, because the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Not because Jesus said anything, but because the temple was destroyed, which kind of is an interesting point. And then every age, that messenger comes with the social laws and teachings. And we may be following those social laws and teachings without understanding their source. Jesus was really the true source of that teaching. The Jews followed in that particular case, probably that and many other teachings of Jesus without realizing that Jesus was the source. And that happens in age after age. In the age of Muhammad, we followed a lot of what Muhammad taught. In the age of Jesus, we followed a lot of what Jesus taught. Part of the problem we have is that we get attached to the name. The name is not important. The teachings are important. A rose by any other name would still be a rose, according to Shakespeare. And so Jesus by any other name would still be Jesus. Moses by any other name would still be Moses. And Muhammad by any other name would be Muhammad. And Baha'u'llah, we're going to get to, would still be Baha'u'llah. So the other thing you should know about how this works is when God reveals his word through each prophet, there's a same pattern that happens very similar in every age. So I'm going to go back to Moses 3,500 years ago. God says to God, God brings his word through Moses. Now Moses comes to these uh, Jews who actually weren't even Jews yet, technically, because Jews follow Mosaic law, but these people in Egypt that are suffering greatly under the Egyptians and the Egyptian priests re resist. They, he, they chase him out of Egypt and he has to run for his life. Eventually, he leads his people to the promised land. And what follows is a great golden age, which lasts for centuries. So this is, the, this is the great Jewish golden age. This pattern happens over and over again. Why? Because God sends the perfect messenger at the perfect time. So it's in other words, that, that message is perfectly adapted to that time. So when, when the people enact the teachings of Moses... They, they go to the highest level. So this is, the, this is an incredible society. From slavery, they, they go to the kingdom of Israel. The next one up is Zoroaster, 500 years later, approximately, in Persia. Now, what happens? Of course, he, always the religious leaders, because they don't want to change, they resist. So the priests try to kill him three times. They jail him. Nothing works. The king eventually adopts his faith. He lives through all of this. And that becomes the heart of the great Zoroastrian golden age. And this, this empire, that's really the center of the great Zoroastrian golden age, ends up lasting for a thousand years. As, and probably most people haven't heard of Zoroaster or the great Zoroastrian golden age, but you might have heard of the great Persian empire, which was the greatest empire of its age. The next one is Buddha. Buddha comes, he suffers, he talks about his suffering, and then he raises his people to a great golden age called the Mori Empire, centering on the Mori Empire, which is a great Buddhist empire, which hits 2 million square miles at its peak. Again, the greatest, if you actually look at how the Mori Empire ran, it was the greatest empire of its age. This, this pattern just keeps happening and happening. The next one is Jesus. Now, they, a dozen messiahs come. All the Jews are expecting the messiah. So a dozen people claim to be the messiah. And one of them was this Jesus fellow. And they crucify them all. And that was it. No, maybe not. I got that wrong. They crucified them all, and one of them, we still know their names, and that was Jesus. Jesus was a little different. And when they crucified Jesus, after three days, according to the Baha'i writings, the resurrection, his teachings were resurrected, his spirit was resurrected, and his disciples went far and wide teaching this beautiful teaching of Jesus. And so he, he, he unites these warring tribes um, in the Eastern Roman Empire, and it becomes called the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantine Empire actually lasts far longer than the Roman Empire did. It lasted for over a thousand, well over a thousand years. And that was the heart of this great Christian golden age. The next one is Muhammad. Now, Muhammad comes to this terrible time, this terrible place where they're burying their daughters alive in Arabia. And the reason they're doing this is because men are killing each other so fast in war that women have become expendable. And Muhammad comes and he starts teaching love and peace and justice and mercy and compassion and unity. And he unites these warring tribes, not just across Arabia, but all the way to Persia, all the way across North Africa, all the way 
to Spain. And for over 500 years, it's called the golden age of Islam. So he takes these incredibly depraved people and raises them up to the highest heights during the golden age of Islam. This was during the dark ages of Christianity. Now, does anybody know anything they invented during this golden age? Thank you. I've never heard that one. Triangular sail. I remember that. Anything else? Algebra. Very good. Algebra algorithms is another one. So if you have a cell phone, thank the Muslims because you know you got to have algorithms to have a cell phone and computers. Um, also, uh, they invented what's that? The fork. I didn't know that. Yeah, I've learned two new. Ones. That's for I'm learning a lot tonight. See, I told you she knew different stuff than me. Um, they also invented this thing called alchemy, you know, modern day chemistry. And uh, they the very first university was was started by a Muslim woman in Africa. You know, those African, uh, what they call them, savages, the ones who invented universities. <laughs> and by the way, we're going to get to one other thing about the African, and I'm saying this tongue in cheek. You know, one thing that we think is Baha'is, and this is very clear, is that all humanity is one and that we're all noble. And it doesn't matter what continent we come from. It doesn't matter what the color of our skin is. We all have contributed. All of our cultures, all of, we, we are all the beneficiaries of, of all these civilizations. But I want to give Africa its due because it doesn't often get its due. And so that's one of the big things. Now, what happens after that? This great, during the, the Muslim Golden Age I mentioned was during the Christian Dark Age. So how do the Christians get out of the Dark Age, at least in Western Europe? Um, they, they're going to need help from the people who have the basically the torch. This torch gets passed from the followers of Moses to the followers of Zoroaster to the followers of Jesus to now it, the followers of Muhammad. And so the Muslim Moors come out of Africa and they are the ones who help raise up the Europeans. So without the Muslim Moors, there's no Renaissance. Without the Renaissance, Europe doesn't reboot and Europe stays in the dark ages. And so they're a big factor in, in the Renaissance. And after the Renaissance, European Christians take over the whole world, virtually the whole world, North America, South America, most of Africa, most of Asia, and Australia. And so just in a few hundred years. And meanwhile, Islam falls off its great golden age. And, and it like, basically, for those of you young, I see all this gray hair here. And there's even a couple of you who might even be a year or two older than me here. We get old. And so do religions. And then the next one comes. So it's just, it's just a, it's a cycle. It's the cycle of the world. The, the circle of life, as you you know, as you, as the Disney movie says, it's really the circle of life, and the same thing goes for religion, that it's renewing itself every five hundred to a thousand years. So, in the eighteen forties, there's this great expectation of that renewal. There's an expectation among Jews, Christians, and Muslims that something great is going to happen, and a messenger is going to come. I'm going to start with the Jews. In eighteen forty, there was a great expectation among the Jews, uh, based on the Zohar, their book of mysticism that the Messiah was going to come and lead the Jews back to the Holy Land, and there was going to be a technological revolution. Well, I'm going to save us some suspense. The Jews didn't see the Messiah in 1840. How about a return to Israel, the Holy Land? Did the Jews ever get to get back to, what do you think? Did they get to return to Israel? Okay, anybody, what year? What year did they get to go back? 1948, the most common answer, which is off by... 104. The, the real answer is 1844. And if you ask a Baha'i any year, you just say 1844, you'll probably be right. So 1844 is the actual answer. And that is the Ottoman Edict of Toleration, which allows the Jews to start coming back. By 1948, the most common answer I get, there was over 600,000 Jews that had come back. Between 130 AD, when the Jews were kicked out after the failed Bar Kokhba rebellion, to 19... To, to 1844, there's only a, a few thousand Jews in Israel, maybe 5,000 tops. Then all of a sudden in 1844, they start coming back after the Ottoman Edict of Toleration allows them to return. By 1948, over 600,000 Jews are back. That's when you have the UN partition. Today, there's 7 million Jews in modern day Israel. So the Jews have definitely come back. Technological revolution, which, which they predicted, what do, you, what do you think? Do, have we had a technological revolution? I always like to ask a young guy this because he hasn't seen as much as us old folks. I knew you'd get it. I was counting on you. So yes, definitely is excellent. And I love that you said it with enthusiasm. 
That's absolutely right. So definitely is right. 75% of the inventions in, in the history of the entire world have happened since 1844. So 25% in the thousands of years leading up to it, and in about 175 years since, 75% of all the, so cars, trucks, phones, yeah, even, I'm gonna scare some of you young kids, even these things did not exist in 1844. Or when I was your age, when I was your age, we didn't have these. Really? Okay, no zippers either. So, but going on, so the Jews didn't see the Messiah, we move on. Now, Christians, Christians are waiting for something in the 1840s all over the world in Germany, in France, in Scandinavia, in Switzerland, in Holland, in England, in North America. There's a guy named Joseph Wolf going all over the Middle East. They're all saying the same thing. What are they expecting in the 1840s? The return of Christ in clouds and the end of the world. Who's saying this? Some big names. How about Martin Luther? He predicts in 1540 that Christ will return within 300 years by 1840. So there are people following Martin Luther. Uh, John Wesley and the Methodist, he says by 1836. Joseph Smith and the Mormons throughout the 1820s, 30s, early 1840s, Smith is proclaiming that, that Christ is going to imminently return. A woman named Harriet Livermore, she, has, she goes in the steps of Congress, actually from the seat of the Speaker of the House of Congress, publicly proclaims in 1843 that Christ will imminently return. And the biggest one of all here in America is the great William Miller. Raise your hand if you've heard of William Miller. He was really famous in his day. He was a, a farmer, and he was a survivor of, eight, of the War of 1812. It was kind of miraculous. He becomes very religious. He studies the Bible, and he tells his family that he, about the, that Christ is going to return in 1844. And he's a pretty shy guy. He makes a, public, he makes a private vow with God that he's not going to tell anyone about this in 1831. Less than an hour later, his son-in-law asks him to speak at a church, a local church which he goes to, and this becomes a trend, and basically an avalanche. Miller ends up speaking all over the country and Canada, too. Gets over 100,000 followers. They're filling these rooms with 6,000 people all talking about the imminent return of Christ. And they're pretty sure it's going to happen in 1844. Miller finally settles on the date of October 22nd, 1844. Did the world end on October 22nd, 1844? How do you know? That's right. And that's how they knew on October 23rd, 1844, that the world had not ended. What was the problem? The Bible. You see, Miller thought the world was going to end because he was reading the King James Bible. And the King James Bible, in many verses, there's about five or six verses, at least, that say, they, they ask Jesus, when's it going to happen? And Jesus says, at the end of the world. But that's not what the Bible actually says. That's a mistranslation in the King James Bible. It's been corrected in every single new Bible. He actually says at the end of the age. So Miller thought that Jesus was saying it's going to happen at the end of the world, which is what the Bible said at the time, but it was a mistake. And everybody at the time was reading that Bible. So they all thought the world would end. It didn't end. They should have been looking for a new age, but they weren't. So we move on. Oh, one other thing about the Christian Bible, which I find interesting. The number 1260. Did it, raise your hand if you knew this. Almost nobody knows this, not even Baha'is. The number 1260 is in the Christian Bible, 10 separate verses. You knew that. 10 separate verses. Seven times in the book of Revelation, three times in the book of Daniel, all the prophetic parts. Anybody know what that means who's not a Baha'i? <laughs> Christians don't know what it means, but it's all over the Christian Bible. And the reason Christians don't know what it means is because it's not a Christian year. It's a Muslim year. And so it comes in the Muslim year 1260, because the Bible's talking about the Muslims, actually, in, in the whole, all those 10 different verses. It's talking about Muhammad and Ali, two witnesses. Muhammad and Ali will come and reign for 1260 days, which is 1260 years. It's basically saying something really big is going to happen in the Muslim year 1260. And what's interesting is Muslims not reading the Christian Bible are also set on the year 1260. Shia Muslims in, in Persia, in, in the year 260, which what, what happens is, I'll just have to go back into history. Muhammad died 
dies, his chosen successor is Ali. Ali is killed. He's the first imam. He's his chosen successor. The next 10 imams are also killed. So now 11 straight imams have been killed. The 12th imam disappears in 260 Muslim years. The Quran indicates he's going to reappear a thousand years later, 1260. You've come for the really good part. It's perfect timing. Um, so 1260 Muslim years is when they're all waiting, almost all of Persia. And they're waiting for the 12th imam to come back. Most of Persia thinks he's in occultation. He's in hiding. And this thousand-year-old man is going to come out of hiding in 1260. Oh, one other really cool thing. 1260 is 1844. 1260 in Muslim years is 1844. Miller, who would who'd come to the year 1844, came there from Daniel 814, which is the 2300-day prophecy, a totally different prophecy that still got him to the year 1844. But anyway, the Muslims get to 1844, almost all of Persia is waiting, and a thousand-year-old man does not come out of hiding. Just to, I know, I know there was suspense on that. There's no such thing as a thousand-year-old man. I bet even you knew that, right? Yeah. You don't have to be a genius to know that. But there are people in Persia, modern-day Iran, who are still waiting for a now almost 1,200-year-old man to come out of a well. And I, I don't want to let you down all the suspense, but that's also not going to happen. But there was a group called the Shakis, and the Shakis thought that a young man would come. And they thought that a young man would come between the ages of 20 and 30, and he would come as the spiritual return of the 12th Imam. Wait a second, that could actually happen. And what's even more, it did happen. May 23rd, 1844, the Bob comes. The Bob means the gate, as in the gate to an entire new age for all humanity. The Bob comes on May 23rd, 1844, and publicly declares that he's the 12th Imam. He's Imam Mahdi, the one, the promised one of Islam. This doesn't happen quietly. By the way, the next day, May 24th, 1844, not to be outdone, Samuel Morse sends the first telegraph. What hath God wrought? Yes. The very next day, that's the start of, that's one of our big inventions that gets us to the modern age. So God didn't wait long. Now, Persia, this isn't a very quiet thing. Persia goes crazy. The Bob's religion, he start Bobbyism spreads like wildfire. He gets thousands and thousands and thousands of followers. The king sends his most trusted scholar, Fahid, with a sword to, to go check out the Bob. And by the way, he takes the sword to kill the Bob if the Bob isn't who he says he is and publicly vows that he'll kill him if he isn't who he says he is, which he clearly thinks he isn't. So they meet and Vahid spends 45 minutes pontificating on how great he is and showing the Bob all his knowledge. And then the Bob starts talking. And it's clear that Vahid is, is beyond outmatched, that there's, he's never heard anything like this. And Vahid goes home a little bit out of sorts, comes back the next day so upset that he forgets his questions. The Bob answers them anyway, comes back a third day, and the Bob then proceeds to reveal the word of God right in front of him. It's like a waterfall coming out of his pen hour after hour, humanly impossible, never stops, never hesitates. And by the time he's done in a single day, he's revealed the equivalent of one third of the Quran all new revelation. Vahid reads what he's, what he's written. He's watched him reveal it. And Vahid, who came in so skeptical, says, if all the forces on earth were leagued against me, I would not abandon my confidence in the success of this cause. That's what he writes back to the king. Never goes back to the king, the Shah who sent him. Instead, five years later, he gives his life. 400 other religious scholars do the same. 100,000 followers. And now the mullahs of Persia have a severe problem. You see, in Shia Islam, there's no clergy natively. So out of the goodness, out of the kindness, out of the most wonderfulness of their hearts, out of care for the people, which may be true initially, they, they've, ra they've risen up to help the people with the understanding that they're only temporarily borrowing the power from the 12th Imam. And as soon as the 12th Imam comes, they're going to give it back. So now the 12th Imam is right in front of them. And they have to make a decision. What do they do? Do they give back their power or do they put them in jail? Okay, now the Baha'is know the answer. I want someone who doesn't know the answer to tell me a guess. What, what, do you know the answer? Yes, they did put them in jail. But the jailer becomes a believer. 
and they put him in another jail and that jailer essentially becomes a believer. And so they put him on trial. They say, who are you? I am, I am, I am the promised one you've been expecting for a thousand years. The one who you're waiting for every morning. He goes on in the middle of court. He makes no bones about who he is. So now they have to kill him. So on July 9th, 1850, who hasn't heard the story? Raise your hand. Because I won't say, okay, there's a few people who haven't heard it. Okay. So on July 9th, 1850, they go to get him out of his cell. The Bob's before they take, go to take him away, he says, I'm sorry, you can't kill me right now. No earthly force can take me before I'm ready to go. He was talking to his secretary. They take him anyway. They tie him up against the wall. They tie up a niece, a young man who wants to be killed with him. They shoot them both. 750 times with rifles in front of a crowd of thousands. This actually happened in Tabriz, Persia. We have many eyewitness accounts. And the question is, I'm going to pick on you, Coach, because you haven't heard it before. Dead or alive? 750, approximately. Should have been dead. But I'm going to ask you again. What's that? They were professional soldiers. Should have been dead is a good answer. Somewhat accurate. In fact, it's 100% accurate. Should have been dead. But was he actually dead? He was alive and not there. So when the smoke cleared, the ropes were shot through. Anise's follower was standing there unharmed. And the Bob was nowhere to be found. So they did a frantic search. And they found him several minutes later in his cell, finishing his mission, which is what he said he needed to do. I'm going, to, I'm going to digress for a second, Let me right after this, and explain this. Um, he finishes his mission. He says, okay, you can kill me now. They take him, and they tie him up again. They tie a niece up again. Sam Khan, the original executioner, pulls his entire regiment, which was uh, Christian. It was Armenian Christian regiment. Sam Khan was an Armenian Christian. And they replace him with a Muslim regiment, which shoots and kills the Bab and a niece. I'm just going to say one thing about miracles. Baha'is don't really believe in miracles per se. Everything is explainable. We believe in science. So there's absolutely a scientific reason that explains how the Bob wasn't killed. I just don't know it. <laughs> so don't ask me how, but I'm not a messenger of God. And then I'm going to explain a miracle from my perspective. This is a very personal explanation, so don't take it as an official Baha'i explanation. So if you don't like it, blame it all on me. I have a, a St. Bernard by, by the name of Bear, who I adore. It's my favorite dog in the world. And uh, very handsome St. Bernard. And uh, we give him dog food. And every time we open up a can of dog food, it's a miracle to Bear. He has no idea where that dog food came from, nor will he ever. And that miracle happens every day. But it's not a miracle to us. It's not a miracle to us. We know where that dog food came from. So with the Bob, were the dogs. The Bob knew it was happening. I can't explain it. And, I, and I, there's just some things that are above my pay grade. So with the messengers of God, they're a higher level being, all of them, Jesus, Moses, miracles abound. We don't understand them. It doesn't mean they're really miracles. They're events that we don't understand, just like dog food. <laughs> so anyway, um, Going back to the, the, the Bob, they, 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 they killed the Bob. They don't stop there. They've been killing his followers all along. And they kill, by 1852, they've killed over 20,000 of his followers. And only two main leaders are alive. One is a woman, one is a man. The woman is Tahereh. Tahereh pulls off her veil in 1848, and she announces two the people, it was actually the first uh, convention of the Bob's followers. She announces this is a new age and a new faith. Some people thought it was just a reform movement within Islam. And she says, no, this is a new age and a new faith, and there's going to be new laws. And she says, one of those new laws is women are equal to men. What do you think? Are girls equal to boys? I, I don't want to scare you. You're nodding pretty. It's okay. You can answer. I think she said yes. Is that a yes? Yeah. What do you think? Girls equal to boys? Yeah. 
Good. You're going to, that means you'll get fed tonight. That's good. So this is very radical at the time. Days after she does this comes the very first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls, New York. Now, meanwhile, Tahare is teaching this new faith from behind a curtain. Tahare embarrasses the men, the, the male scholars who've gone against her. She's incredibly brilliant. She's also incredibly beautiful. So as they're killing all the leaders, the king offers to marry Tahare. If she becomes a Muslim again, she gives up the Babi faith. She says, no, you keep your faith. I'll keep mine. She keeps going. Eventually, they do arrest her. She puts on her wedding dress and be, while her killers come for her, as they come for her, she says, you can kill me as soon as you like, but you cannot stop the emancipation of women. And so that goes on if anyone's reading the papers in Iran to this very day and all over the world. That leaves one left, Baha'u'llah. His name means the glory of God. The glory of God is the son of a provincial governor, one of the wealthiest men in Persia. At an early age, at the age, how old are you again? At your age, Baha'u'llah was already known for his great wisdom. And all the adults came to him and asked him all sorts of questions. D did they do that to you? That's okay. You're actually, I can tell, a very smart 13-year-old. I was a pretty smart 13-year-old too, but I can tell you nobody came to me. No adults came to me and asked me any questions like that. But they did Baha'u'llah. By the way, Jesus was known for great innate wisdom. So was Muhammad. So was the Bob. That's just a, that's something that messengers are known for. By his early 20s, he's known as the father of the poor because his dad is one of the wealthiest men in Persia. He's very, very generous with his dad's great wealth. At 22, he turns down a provincial governorship when his dad dies. In his mid-20s, Baha'u'llah becomes a, a follower of the Bob and a great leader in the Babi cause. And in 1852, they've killed all the other leaders. He's the last one standing. They arrest him, they torture him, they put 100-pound chains on his shoulders, they drag him through the streets, and they put him in a place called the Black Pit. And it's in the Black Pit, three stories underground, that Baha'u'llah sees the vision of a maiden. The maiden says, you're the promised one of all faiths. So for the Hindus, the 10th avatar, for the Buddhists, the 5th Buddha, for the Jews, the Messiah, for the Christians and the Muslims, the return of Christ. And not to leave the Zoroastrians out, he's the Shah Baram. You see, all faiths are waiting for a redeemer, and he's that redeemer. He's released from that prison. And for 40 years, he suffers harsh exile, finally to the worst prison city in the Ottoman Empire. And he reveals, during those 40 years of harsh exile, the equivalent of 60 Christian Bibles. And he essentially leaves humanity with a roadmap to world peace. He says, I brought the most great peace, and we get it when we understand the oneness of humanity. So he says, sexism, get rid of it. Women are equal to men. Racism, get rid of it. One human race. Nationalism, the earth is but one country. Mankind, its citizens. And religious prejudice, he says, all these great religions, we're fighting and killing each other. You know, Judaism is right. Christianity is right. And you're wrong. He says, no, they're all right. Christianity is this beautiful chapter in God's eternal faith, and so is Islam, and so is Judaism, and they're all wonderful. Don't hate someone because they're a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim. Love them and understand that we're all following the same God. And that he says the differences in religion are only the outer garment, that it's really only one faith. And it's always ever been one faith because there's only ever been one God. And if they're from God, love them all. Love the prophets and love their followers. And he says, when we understand what love thy neighbor really means. It's not just love your Christian neighbor. It's love all your neighbors. It's not just love your Baha'i neighbor. It's love all your neighbors without exception. Then we get world peace. That's what the Baha'i faith is for. And, and the Bible predicts it. Now, back in Revelation, Revelation 21, the, the great new Jerusalem coming down from the sky to be lit, to be lit Revelation 21, 11 and 21, 23, by Baha'u'llah. Literally says that it's going to be lit by the glory of God. The most great peace. That's the previous chapter. That's what we're in. Now, it doesn't feel like that because peace doesn't grow in a day. But that's what Baha'is are doing. That's what we're all doing, whether we're Baha'is or not. We're growing the most great peace. And the more we work for it, the better. And the, soon, the better it will be and the sooner it will come. So that's, that's it. That's what Baha'is are. Any questions?
Well, so the, the question, the question is, the question, oh, I'm sorry. so the question is, why can't we have alcohol? So there's laws. Now, God's laws can be done one of two ways. Actually, there's three ways we can do it. One is we can ignore them and do it whatever we want. The other extreme is you have to do this or you're going to burn in hell forever. We don't do that as Baha'is. Baha'is are in the middle of that. So there's guidance from God. Now, if we assume that God is all knowing and all wise and all loving and all merciful, then any law from God would be better than anything we can do. So Baha'u'llah has said that alcohol is bad for us. So let's look at the facts, which I have, because I, I had to put a relative, unfortunately, who's doing really well now through uh, alcohol rehab. Uh, within the last two years, I've had to pay for one relative, close relative, who was living us at, at, with us at the time through alcohol rehab and another close relative through drug rehab. Uh, I, so Baha'u'llah says no to both. So 3 million people die every year from alcoholism in, in the world. 3 million people died of COVID. That's you know the, the first year of COVID, and we shut down the whole world. We just go on like nothing's happening with alcohol, but it kills 3 million people a year. 95% of the rapes on college campuses involve alcohol. Divorces, car accidents, you know, you can liver damage, all sorts of health problems. And now it's coming out that even one glass of alcohol, first sip of alcohol is bad for you. They used to say one, one, one cup is one, one glass of wine is good. They're saying no, even that's bad. It's very clear that the world would be better off if we follow Baha'u'llah. Having said that, I am a Baha'i. Most of the people I work with are not Baha'is. And when they drink, I don't say a word. I mean, if they run over my child while they're drinking, I might say something. But beyond that, it's not mine to judge. It's ours, what Baha'u'llah says, very, and this is very important, and I will say this to anyone who's not a Baha'i in this room, is we will, as Baha'is, we would never try to enforce our laws on anyone who's not a Baha'i. Baha'u'llah says, he says, walk in my statutes for love of me. So the first thing you do is love Baha'u'llah, acknowledge Baha'u'llah. And then if you know any Baha'is, we do our best to follow him. We don't follow him. We do our best to follow him. But what we don't do is tell other Baha'is what to do. <laughs> so, you know, if Kathy did something wrong on the way here, that's between God and Kathy. I'm not worried about it. By the way, she didn't, but she's a great person. But, but, but that's it. It'd be more likely that I did something wrong and, and you know, Kathy's saying, oh, well, <laughs> it's between him and God. That's how we would do it. That's my long answer to a short question. Is that helpful? There's, there's one other thing. When you drink alcohol, the real reason Baha'is don't, don't drink alcohol is because it takes you further from God. And every action you take in every breathing moment, every waking moment should try to bring you closer to God. Substances like alcohol make you further from God. That's the real reason why alcohol is banned. It's not the physical problems, which... Because, you know, cigarettes are bad and they're not banned, although Baha'u'llah said they were dirty and, and ugly, but um, he didn't ban them. And the reason is they're not spiritually doing what alcohol is doing. Alcohol is, is a spirit, you know, alcohol abuse is a spiritual illness. And so Baha'u'llah was trying to help us. I actually stopped drinking when I was 18 and didn't become a Baha'i till I was 49. So I had 31 years as a non-drinking Jew. And I didn't have an excuse not to drink. I just didn't like it. Well, um, <laughs> What's that uh, Kitabi hearsay? <laughs> I could give you a whole bunch of what we call. So essentially, I could tell you a whole bunch of things. And it, it, we call it Kitabi hearsay. In other words, it, it's whatever I make up. Um, some, there's, there's this thing called Pilgrim's Notes. Well, the, someone, someone visited Shoghi Effendi, and they said this. Shoghi Effendi was the guardian of the Baha'i faith. And then it's, it's a lot of what's crept into a lot of religion over the years. So any answer I give you on this is probably going to be wrong. What I would tell you, since I'm going to give a wrong answer anyway, is I think that the world is coming into a time of great peace and that we are at a time of great destruction right now, which, which precedes that time of great peace. 
and they are actual, and this is, this is from the Baha'i writings, there's a dual process going on right now. So this older world order is, is really disintegrating right in front of our eyes. You see how many governments are really falling. Now, you're, you're from Colombia. How's the government in Colombia doing? And my, my wife, and you're... you're And uh, is your husband, is your husband here? Mucho gusto, mi esposa es de Honduras. Tu es de Copan? Yeah, mi esposa es de Tela. So how's, how's the government in, in Honduras doing? <laughs> you know, I'm not picking on Honduras or Colombia. There's so many governments that are doing badly. You know, many people would say the government of the United States is not doing so well. And so um, many, many governments are struggling. School systems are struggling. These systems that were, what's happening is systems that were not designed for the modern age are failing. And we need to remake, you know, the first thing is not the systems. We need to remake our own hearts. Number one, first and foremost, is our own hearts. And then we need to rebuild the system after we rebuild our own hearts. Is what you do every day. Yes, sir. Yeah, the thing is, is that <laughs> the thing is, is that the Baha faith, okay, which is more than than you put all the perspectives, all the different faiths and religions and stuff like that. But the Baha faith, not just in America, but in a lot of places, why is it that the Baha faith is not? Well, when a tree grows, a tree grows from a seed, and then a seed grows into a sapling, and then, it, then the sapling grows into a great oak tree. Now, you could have in the forest a big old oak tree that's dead, and you'd go into the forest, and you'd really notice that big old oak tree, even though it's dead or dying, but the sapling you wouldn't notice because the sapling is under its shadow. You know, so that's my answer is that but, but the, the Baha'i faith is the sapling. So it's a smaller tree. It's under the shadow of these great trees. So you see in the headlines, we were talking about the Pope and the church. You know, you see the Catholic church because the Catholic church is so big right now, but it's also crumbling. You know, I'm sorry if anyone's Catholic here, but my wife is Catholic. So I love, I love Catholics, but... The Catholic Church is very obviously crumbling. So it, it's, it's big and it's crumbling and the Baha'i faith is small and growing. And so everything has its time and place. And another way to say it is the tree doesn't grow in a day. It grows over many dozens of years. And a faith, which is much longer life cycle, grows over hundreds of years. And so the Baha'i faith is still growing. It's becoming more visible every day. So... For example, there was a CNN special uh, a couple of weeks ago about interfaith, about interracial marriages. And that's something you wouldn't have seen even a few years ago when I first became a Baha'i. Um, there was a little uh, mem meme, little meme going on about going around about Dan Rather, um, the anchor, uh, the, the news person. And he, um, he talked beautifully about the Baha'i faith. And so there was a couple years ago, there was a thing on modern, it's not modern family. It was, it was, it was a major show and they, they had a, a mention of a major mention of the Baha'i faith. Th those kind of things are happening more and more often. And I happen to be in Hollywood and it's my job, I think, to take the, you know, to, to start changing that. So one of the reasons I'm in Hollywood is to have Baha'is be a little bit more prominent. My, my business partner, Justin Baldoni, is very publicly a Baha'i. Rain Wilson, who we're putting in a movie we're filming next month, is very publicly a Baha'i. And so as this goes on, it's, the light will just get bigger and bigger and bigger. If Another way to say it is if Baha'u'llah is who Baha'u'llah says he was. And I'm utterly convinced that's the case. Which is the foundation of the 
expand from that religious state. Well, the, the religions were, were introduced at a time when it wasn't necessary to do that. So Christianity is much more about individual salvation because at the time of Christ, that's what we could understand. But now we're ready to understand global unity. So that's what Baha'u'llah has, has revealed. There is no superiority at all from Baha'u'llah versus Jesus because Jesus was perfect. Even when Baha'u'llah talks about the equality of women and men, he doesn't say, well, that Jesus, he was wrong. And here's an... He doesn't say that at all. He says, he says, women and men have always been equal in the eyes of God. And so as a Baha'i, I know that Jesus was the eyes of God at that time. But Jesus himself says in John 9, 5, he says, I'm the light of the world while I'm in the world. And so he is that light that was sent at that time. Muhammad was the light at that time. And so they give their, their, their message with the lens or the understanding that this is the perfect message that humanity can understand at that time. So that young lady, that very bright young lady just got up and she's, she's sitting in her mom's lap. I'm not going to teach her calculus, even though she's probably perfectly smart and able to learn calculus, just not yet. And so you don't want to teach calculus to a nine-year-old, but you do want to teach calculus maybe to a high school or college person. Same thing. So that's kind of the way I I look at the Baha'i faith. These messages are here now. And the other religions, um, they have the heart of the message because it's one faith. The Christian faith is not from a different God. There's not a Christian God. The Christian religion is an earlier version of the Baha'i faith. And it has the kernels, the seeds of everything in the Baha'i faith. Yeah. So. Well, we're, we're working on it. That's what I'm here tonight to do. <laughs> yeah, so, we, you know, we Baha'is work on it, but it takes some time. And we've got people who don't want that message to come out. You know. Yes. 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 Well, the messages all have the seeds of unity because they're from the same God. You know, God is God. God always loved us, but we just weren't ready to hear some of the things in the Baha'i faith 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago. So, you know, Jesus says, I have more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now, albeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come. This is John 16, 12, and 13. He says, albeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he'll tell you of all things. And so, and, and Baha'u'llah comes, and when he comes, he cites that exact verse when he went in his tablet to the Christians, and he says, here I am, I'm the spirit of truth, I've come to tell you. And then he reveals 60 Christian Bibles, and he, he's in the process of doing that. So what Jesus is saying, I can't tell you everything, I know more, but I'm not going to tell you right now, because you're not ready to hear it. And then when Baha'u'llah comes, he'll tell you. Yeah. 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 So, you know, an easy way to look at it is there's the faith of God in the time of Jesus, the faith of God in the time of Muhammad, the faith of God in the time of Baha'u'llah. And that becomes more unifying. So it's the faith of God then, the faith of God then, and the faith of God now. Well, it, it, so the Bible says over and over again, I'm going to come like a thief in the night. So a thief in the night comes when we're asleep. So the Bible clearly says we're going to be asleep when I come. And but then, as you said, it, all lies will be upon me. So how do you reconcile the two? The only thing is the thief comes. But you don't see the thief because you're asleep. If you were awake, you would see the thief. And so the thief comes in the night when we're asleep. But we're eventually going to wake up. And then we'll see the thief. This thief, yes, this, this, this thief, yeah, this, this thief is a good thief. I was, I was just going to say that um, I always tried to keep in mind that 
the Baha'i faith has only we're like less we're like 150 years or less old yeah. you know since Baha'u'llah died it's been just a little over 100 years so if you think back to the early Christians you know how widespread was the Christian faith say 150 years after the death of Jesus that's when you had the early Christians living in the catacombs and being persecuted and it was a very small group so each you know we're at that stage that very beginning stage and then it starts to take off and spread which is happening i think now but 131 years no you go ahead <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a tough one because this is so I, i'm will schaumbach i teach at usf religion and tony came uh to one of my classes on social justice and one of the and the students were really fascinated uh and really attracted to this message of unity but then they were like well so what's the deal with women in leadership yeah so women are in the baha'i leadership on every level in every place throughout the world so there's thousands and thousands of women who are in baha'i leadership um you know kathy's done a lot for the faith so um i don't mess with kathy um but women are on the national spiritual assembly they're on the local spiritual assemblies they're in the international teaching so so the question is are there women in baha'i leadership yeah everywhere and in fact in unprecedented levels if you look at it you know compared to other religions women are make up internationally over 40 percent of the baha'i leadership um, which is really, really high, given that, you know, there's some countries where women can't do anything. But there's one place where women are exempted from service. So the, the Baha'i leadership is a service thing. So women are exempted from service at the Universal House of Justice, arguably the hardest job you could possibly have. Yes. So, so Kathy, you worked around the House of Justice. What kind of job was that? <laughs> so can I also say that we had a, a woman serve as regent as head of the faith for several years, uh, the daughter of Baha'u'llah. So uh, women out, we have women who outrank the members of the House of Justice. The House of Justice is a collective body that only gets to vote, I mean, to make decisions collectively by voting. But we have women who as individuals anchor, outrank the members of the House of Justice. What we can say is there are a few things that we just have to trust. And everything that Baha'u'llah said, we, tr we find to be true. And what his son, Abdul Baha, whose picture is here, we know he knew what he was talking about. And they said, men, the men of the House of Justice, we know that there's a promise that in the future, it will be as clear as the sun at high noon, the reason for that. But we simply don't know it now. So I just, he was right about everything else, so I have to trust him on that. Yeah. But but it is you know what I would here's here's what I say to a question like that. In in essence, look at every part of the Baha'i faith. Okay, look at it all, and then after you've looked at the whole thing and everything it represents, then come back to that question and see if it's still relevant. Because I don't think it would be. Uh, let me answer you there. In Baha'i faith, you don't have rank, you don't have position, you don't have power. The biggest power you have is the most service you render to the community. So you don't have any uh, kind of uh, competition for having power. You're not even paid to do that job. So the whole point is that the humblest you are, the more servant you are. And the highest rank Abdul Baha defines as servant of the servant, that he takes it as his own title. So in the faith is the opposite. Nobody works for power. Everybody works to be the best servant they, they can possibly be and help the other people to enter the path of service. So it's a complete different spiritual view of life. I, 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 I disagree, you know what I mean? 
to a certain extent with what she's saying, but I also disagree with, 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 with what I don't disagree with, with the question was with women in leadership from the Baha'i faith, but what I'm listening to. Yeah, so women are in leadership, leadership is what I'm saying. That's not the issue. That, that's, that's not my focus, is that we all are equal. Yes, that's true. You know what I mean, so we all are equal, male or female, it doesn't matter the title. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. You know, through the, through the whole scenario of the Baha'i faith. But there are some roles. So here's the thing. There's there's separate, or not separate, but equal, but but actually there are roles. So for example, yeah, we have roles. We have roles. And there are so so like I as a man, even though I'm equal to women, cannot bear a child. I could try, so but roles. I would fail. <laughs> yeah, there are roles, but they're right. still equal as one. Through, right. from, from my understanding of the thing. That's absolutely true. And and I would say that you probably wouldn't want most women out there on the football field. Huh? No. What are you, you probably wouldn't want most women out there on the football field. <laughs> but playing, but but playing for you. I mean, it's too dangerous. It's dang, it would be dangerous. Women would get hurt. Or you do. Oh wow. But but a lot of women couldn't. Oh really? So, I mean, okay, I take that back. <laughs> I guess from, from my viewpoint of view, it's not a competition. We're not competing to be yeah. on the assembly. That's really cool. Competing. That's really cool. You have, you have girls playing? Wow. Okay. It's not a competition, I agree. Yes. 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 That's that's exactly right. So this is great discussion. First of all, um, thank you. You've been awesome. I feel a little bit conflicted because I agree with statements from there and here. So I guess maybe my question is. Um, but I disagree with something you said, which is you just got to have faith. This is how it was, what he said. Women aren't there. Maybe at his time, it was, it couldn't have been acceptable for him to say that. So I, well, I guess what I'm wondering as I'm hearing all this is, is there a scenario there where regardless of what's said, how it should be, that that could be changed, amended, or yes. quote, improved, because it's assuming it's yes. an improvement. So we're, let's say we were to discover something in the writings that was previously not there, yes. Now, the one thing that I would say from a Baha'i perspective is Baha'u'llah was not a man of his time. Baha'u'llah was a manifestation of his time. A manifestation is not a man. Jesus was not a man, essentially. He was a physical man, but spiritually he was far more than a man, which is why he, his, his teachings have lasted so long. Same thing with Buddha, same thing with Baha'u'llah. So his teaching is not going to last for 100 years or 200 years. It's not going to be trendy. In fact, sometimes it's going to go against our trends. And sometimes we're even going to think it's wrong until we find that's right. A great example of that, this is not a moral teaching, but Baha'u'llah said that space was not a vacuum. He clearly said that. And it wasn't until about 10 years ago that we discovered he was right. So for well over a century, we thought he was wrong. Baha'u'llah says he's not the final answer. You know, there is no end to God sending messengers to us and that someone would be coming in a thousand years. And he said by a thousand years, he meant solar years, not less than a thousand. It could be more than a thousand, but it's not less than a thousand. When they say that for right now, women are not going to serve on the House of Justice, and at some point in the future, it will be as clear as the sun at high noon as to why, they could be talking about something 500 years in the future that we simply don't know. They know it's going to happen. We don't know what it is. So that's why there's an element of faith, because I mean, Baha'u'llah wrote to Kaiser Wilhelm. He said, uh, if you don't change 
and become a spiritual ruler, I see blood on the banks of the Rhine twice and the lamentation of Berlin. Well, that particular Kaiser didn't live to see the Second World War. Baha'u'llah knew it was coming if he didn't change his tune. So we don't know what the future has. He does. Baha'u'llah has this wonderful image he gives us. He said these manifestations of God, these, these messengers who reflect God. If Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. They're like birds sitting on a tree, high up on a tree. And that tree is at the edge between the next world and this world. And they see both sides. We don't have that perspective, but they do. Who is, who, who is the, the, the they, first of all? But the reason why I'm saying that is because I'm still stuck on, back to what she said with the community services and the service and the stuff that the Baja faith does, which is the unifying to everybody is equal. Everybody is together. Everybody is one. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm stuck on that with the services that we do in the communities to actually teach that to our young people who are growing up today. You know what I'm saying? And so I, I'm a little conflict, you know, where she's at. So who's saying who they, they are not people. So here's the thing. So really, okay, so we're going to go to what is a manifestation of God? So I'm not a manifestation of God. Baha'u'llah says not another manifestation of God like him for a thousand years. So I have a story, and this is interesting because I told this story. We do Baha'i study groups several times a week, and I did this in one of I, I wrote, told this story in one of my Baha'i study group study groups. There was um, a man, and he was a, a, a wealthy man, a businessman. He comes to see Baha'u'llah when Baha'u'llah was still alive. He died in in 1892. So let's say this is in the 1880s, and he goes to see Baha'u'llah, and he's very impressed because Baha'u'llah, and he's a believer, and he's with other believers, and Baha'u'llah is the wisest man he's ever known, ever seen, and he's, and he's the kindest. He's just incredible, but the problem is he's not a god. He expects a god, so he goes back home, just back to his room that night, disappointed. The same thing happens the second day. Very wise, very kind, but he's not a god. The third day, a servant of Baha'u'llah taps him on the shoulder and says, Baha'u'llah would like to see you alone. So the man goes in to see Baha'u'llah alone. And all he sees is a blinding white light. And he leaves there, just repeating Baha'u'llah's name, completely out of it for two days straight. Can't eat, can't sleep, just repeating Baha'u'llah's name so much that they had to remove him from the general group for a couple of days till he recovered. And a couple of days later, he comes back and Baha'u'llah asks to see him again. And he explains to him, he says, this is why I show as a man, because you can't really understand what I really am. And he says, when you teach a parrot to speak, we do it in front of a mirror. I told the story to my class and a woman in the class said that was my great, great uncle. So that's so when we talk about Baha'u'llah, we can't talk about him. Now, the other thing about Baha'i, and it's very, very important, is you're not a Baha'i. You don't have to believe any of this until if you ever become a Baha'i. We don't force our view. Okay, no, okay, you are a Baha'i. Okay, you are a Baha'i. Okay, so, okay, so if you were not a Baha'i, we wouldn't enforce. And even if you are a Baha'i, we don't enforce anything upon you in terms of beliefs. It's for each person to independently search, as you know. So we learn as we go. And there's things even I'm discovering today as a Baha'i of almost eight years that I had that I still don't know. The important thing of the manifestation of God is his writing. The, the level that we understand and apply the, the writing is the uh, power that comes true within the unity that we build. So all these manifestations said things, but what happened? People did not do it. Simple as that. So a manifestation can do a lot of things, but uh, us as human, our power is to follow it, to try to understand it, 
to try to apply it. We will never get to that perfection, but at least we try. And that's the beauty of this in the Baha'i faith. We can try it together with everybody, whether you're Baha'i or not. Everybody is welcome to try it. And everybody should receive the message. It's not exclusive. It's for everyone. There's one other special gift we have, which we haven't even mentioned his name, which we should always. And that is that gentleman right there. Thank you. Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha uh, is called the exemplar of the Baha'i faith. He was Baha'u'llah's oldest son. And Baha'u'llah said he was the example. He was sent down here as the example for all of us. And so not only do we have Baha'u'llah's writings, we have literally his own work of art, Abdul Baha. And Abdul Baha, when, um, when you look at his life, was really the perfect Baha'i. You know, and, and he's our perfect exemplar. And so you know, sometimes I ask myself, what would Abdul Baha do? And it's not always good for me because I'm like, oh, I have to do that. But that's what Abdul Baha would do. <laughs> for example, I, I'll just say personally, so we, my, my wife and I uh, bought our daughter a house. She's a student at Northwestern and her neighbor hates her, her next door neighbor, not because she's done anything wrong because my daughter is really sweet, but because she doesn't like college students and she assumes that my daughter is going to have really wild parties which is kind of funny because my daughter has migraine headaches and can't stand loud noises. So she literally physically, medically could not have loud parties. But my neighbor hadn't asked her that or understood any of this. So she's just been terrible to my daughter. And my inclination was not to be so nice to her, to put it mildly, because I'm a father and this is my daughter. And then I thought, what would Abdul Baha do? And so there's a story about Abdul Baha he had a person in Akko, Israel, that for over 20 years was a, a clergyman, a Muslim clergyman, who was just terribly mean to him, publicly mean to him, would publicly say terrible things about him. And finally, after over 20 years, the man noticed Abdul Baha and how sweet and kind Abdul Baha was, and they became friends. So I figure if Abdul Baha can do it, I can try it, at least for another five minutes. So I sent our neighbor a gift basket for, for the holidays, and she responded well. But I have to say it was only because of Abdul Baha. <laughs> no, no, please go ahead. No, no, we have a, hang on. You had a question back there a while ago? Here. Whenever a manifestation announces that he is a manifestation, the energy that is released around the world starts happening. In the time of Moses, he, he create, the energy that was created created statehoods. In the time of Abraham, it created tribes. In the time of Christ, it created statehoods. In the time of Muhammad, it created nations. And in time of the Bab and Baha'u'llah, it created world oneness, starting with the United Nations, where their main function is to unite the world under a banner of peace and love. And that is a principle that is taught by every Baha'i. Peace, honor, justice. Baha'u'llah himself said the greatest attribute is justice. And how can you have that without peace, without unity? Thank you. Keep going, keep going. I have a question. Okay. When our generation is gone and we're all dead. Who is going to take over uh, what generation or what kind of life or human when we're all gone is going to take over the Baha'i religion? You want to answer that, young man? Us 
kids of all of the Baha'is. My mother right here. This kid. My, uh, my thing is, and, and the manifestation is what you're using, which is the origin of the foundation. And, and back to what she said earlier, which is the community service and the stuff that she does. And back to what the guy back there was saying, way back here, which is all the unified and, and, and what's the foundation of the Baha faith is. Is unity. It's unity. As, as he said, unity yeah. and justice. Yeah, what, what he said, like I say, but what, and actually it shows to what she said with this community service and the services that you do through the communities, don't make no difference where they at, or, you know, it still shows of the equalness, the unity, the togetherness. That's the foundation that actually to all of them, I don't care which religion you use, have that same manifestation, the same foundation. It's just how they apply it. Well, it's, it's, just, it's just how deep it is applied. So, yeah, how deep so, and actually his point that you have tribes, then you have cities, and then you have nations, and now you have federation worldwide. Worldwide, uh, the Baha'i World Commonwealth is actually used in the Baha'i writings and the writings of Shoghi Effendi. Yes. That's my thought, but it's not in the writings, at least as far as I know, but yes, that's what I believe. <laughs> yes. Uh, the and, one, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to say the one thing I was going to add uh, kind of goes back to the theme of the night. Um, we we're talking about the growth of the faith and why we're not seeing it as much. What we're seeing, though, the principles established by Baha'u'llah is very much like progressive revelation. The world is being compelled to the principles Baha'u'llah established. Right now, it's more about elimination of prejudices with yesterday, Martin Luther King Day. Today, now is I, the first time I heard about this. Uh, it's a new day. Uh, it's a, another a day of recognition about trying to end racism is today, the day after Martin Luther King Day. So the uh, same thing with the equality of women and men. We're seeing what's happening in Iran. The world is being compelled to the principles of Baha'u'llah. Yeah. Can, can I also say, I, I, I was fortunate, I spent 18 years in the Holy Land and spent a lot of time around the Sea of Galilee. And I just often would think there on that uh, lake, lake shore, those primarily illiterate fishermen and, and tradespeople and so forth, I mean, if you had said to them, you're going to go out and conquer the world, you guys here in this remote nowhere place, you know, that it's a backwater this is in Rome. And you, Peter, there, do you know that more than a thousand years from now, the biggest building in the world is going to be built in the center of Rome? Well, he would have believed that. And it's going to be named for you. He would have been flabbergasted. You've heard that from me before. But, you know, I mean, this is, he wouldn't have believed it, you know? So I just feel I am lucky. I stumbled into early Christianity during its early stages, but the next version of it, you know, the coming of Christ, I stumbled into it. How lucky am I, you know? And those early Christians who are out there trying to get the message out, you know, someone like St. Patrick. Uh, I just did the Camino, which has retraced the, the steps of St. James walking through Spain proclaiming that Christ had come. I thought, well, since we're here anyway, I proclaim Baha'u'llah once or twice. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to proclaim it and proclaim it and proclaim it until people listen. And is it important? Well, I was in a, a group called, I mean, I am in a group called YPO, Young Presidents Organization. And it's, it's a business organization. And I was the only, I am the only Baha'i in the group. And one day, one of my the fellow, uh, we we're in a forum together, this group together, he asked me if everyone, just in the middle of, a, just out of the blue, we weren't talking about faith or anything. He says, if everyone in the world were Baha'is, would we have world peace? And I said, yes. On a, it didn't, didn't hesitate at all, yes. 
And he looks at me and, and then we went back to the same conversation. Dear friends, I'm, I'm looking at the clock and I know it is indeed a, a work in school night. So if we could have Tony have one more song and then we have lots of refreshments in the other room. We're not gonna whisk Steve away immediately. So those who wanna speak to him and ask more questions, that would be great. And we can also have some fellowship. People running around every day Wondering why things are changing so fast Don't know what to do, don't know what to say Got so many questions to ask From pillar to post, from coast to coast Confusion all across the land A hidden word is what I'd like to say but tell me, would you listen, my friend? And I'm so glad I know about the blessed beauty. So glad I know about the blessed beauty. I just want, I want, I want to praise his name. So much depression, so much aggression. What's real and who can you trust? Is the purpose of life all struggle and strife? Does it end in ashes and dust? God really cares and he hears your prayers. If you'd only take time to pray. If you can't find the words, you can still be heard. He knows what you're trying to say And that's why I'm so glad I know about the blessed beauty So glad I know about the blessed beauty I just want, I want, I want to praise His name Oh, so glad I know about the blessed beauty. I just want, I want, I want to praise his name. People running around every day Wondering why things are changing so fast Don't know what to do, don't know what to say Got so many questions to ask But if they take some time and see the signs They'd see the sun shine through the rain Cause God sent down his blessed beauty Baha'u'llah is his name and that's why I'm so glad, oh, so glad, oh, so glad I know about the blessed beauty, so glad I know about the blessed beauty I just want I want I want to praise his name Oh Bahaula 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 Oh Mm -hmm. Bahaula, Bahaula, 